here with us today. He'll be How's that? that? There we go. Sorry about the sound problems there. Yeah, good day to all of you that are here in person, and good day to all of you who are joining us uh, virtually uh, through YouTube uh, live. And, uh, you know, my book, Design to the Core, is all about the fine-tuning argument being far more comprehensive than it's been acknowledged in other books. The book is now available. Uh, you can get Design to the Core uh, all the way up through uh, August uh, through a donation of any amount to Reasons to Believe. It'll have a, it'll have a general release, release at the beginning of September. And you can also uh, find quite a bit of material on the fine-tuning uh, argument for God in the book The Creator and the Cosmos, now in its fourth edition. And anyone can get a free chapter at reasons.org slash Ross. Now this morning, um, I made a post uh, quite early uh, about a Roman Catholic uh, priest, uh, a bishop in uh, Colorado, who uh, wrote a really fine piece. And I gave a link on both my Twitter and Facebook pages this morning uh, to the article he wrote about how the James Webb Space Telescope is declaring the glory of God. And uh, you know, something I've made mention of earlier is that when the Bible repeatedly says that heavens declare the glory of God, it's in the context of people lived in the days of Abraham, Jacob, and uh, King David. I mean, you could actually go outside at night and see the heavens. And uh, we're at a disadvantage in the 21st century because the vast majority of the human population, when they go outside at night, uh, they're lucky if they can see 30 stars and maybe see a couple of the planets and the moon, and that's about it. Abraham, when he would look out at the night sky, could see 15,000 stars. He could see the Milky Way and all of its detail, and he saw it as quite a bright uh, represent. And they were seeing the heavens declaring the glory of God every night. And uh, you know, here in the Los Angeles area, you struggle to see 30 stars, even on a clear night. Uh, but if you go to the big Asian cities, you don't see any stars at all, even on a clear night. Uh, in fact, uh, one of our employees had reasons to believe uh, was hosting a student uh, from China. And uh, she said, you've got to tell me, what's that object in the sky? And they said, well, that's the moon. And uh, she had not recognized the moon. Now she says, oh yeah, in China we can see the moon, but only when it's directly overhead. Uh, when it's low in the horizon, uh, the light and air pollution is so intense that you can't see the moon. So the heavens really are not declaring the glory of God to any degree compared to what the ancients were able to see because of the modern technology of light pollution. Matter of fact, there really is no place on the surface of planet Earth today uh, where there is zero light pollution. There's some everywhere. And so astronomers have been saying, well, if you go to the back side of the moon, uh, maybe you can actually see the heavens like the ancients got to see them. However, what I appreciated about what this bishop wrote uh, this morning and had it published in the uh, Pueblo uh, newspaper is he said, when you look at the James Webb Space Telescope, the heavens are declaring the glory of God in a way that's unique to those of us living in the 21st century. And so, again, I, I made a link to the article. Take a look at it. Uh, but I just wanted to show you 
a couple of things I did put earlier, about a week ago, uh, on my uh, Facebook and Twitter pages, which is a comparison of the few images released. There's been six images, seven images released from the Hubble Space Telescope. Five of them were released about 10 days ago. And I posted three of them on my Facebook and Twitter pages. And I chose the three that actually reveal new science. Because uh, a couple of the images, at least in my opinion, uh, were publicity things. Look how much better this telescope is than the Hubble Space Telescope. But I will show you a comparison. So this is the Hubble Space Telescope image of a cluster of galaxies known as SMAX0737. Uh, uh, That's Hubble Space Telescope. And this is the James Webb Space Telescope. So you can notice uh, the difference. Hubble and the James Webb. And uh, what you notice in the James Webb Space Telescope image, you're not just seeing the cluster of galaxies, you're seeing background galaxies. And if you look carefully at this image and come up close, you can see uh, that there's a couple of stars. You can see the things uh, with uh, six cross images. Those are stars. Everything else is galaxies. And uh, you can see these little tiny galaxies here that are you know, looking uh, billions of light years away. The cluster of galaxies that you see here is 4.6 billion light years away. Uh, but the background images are predominantly of galaxies that are 10 to 13 billion uh, light years away. And uh, this is a cluster of galaxies that acts as a gravitational lens. Uh, so what you can see in the Hubble Space Telescope image is that you can see that uh, uh, some of these images uh, seem streaked. And that's the result of the cluster of galaxies acting as a gravitational lens uh, so that the uh, galaxies that are in the background, uh, the cluster of galaxies is basically magnifying uh, the very distant galaxies as the light bends around it. And you can see this in much more uh, detail in the James Webb Space Telescope image. You can see not just one or two elongated streaks of uh, lens background galaxies, but literally dozens of them. So here, 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 uh, down here, here. So you can actually see uh, the cluster of galaxies in a rather complex way, multiple lens way, uh, lensing galaxies uh, that are many billions of light years more distant uh, than what you see there. Another image that was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope where they've done a comparison is what's known as Stefan's Quintet. And uh, because the universe is only 13.8 uh, billion years old, there are places in the universe where you do see galaxies still quite close together. Now, only four of these five galaxies uh, are actually gravitationally uh, linked together. Uh, the fifth one is a back or is a foreground galaxy. So uh, this one is a galaxy that's actually not associated uh, with these others. It's a foreground galaxy, uh, but the other galaxy. Now this is the best image that the Hubble Space Telescope has taken. You'll find five online, but this is the deepest and the best of the Hubble Space Telescope images. But compare that uh, with the James Webb Space Telescope. And what you notice is you're getting approximately equal detail uh, of the five galaxies. The difference is the background. When you look in the background, uh, you can see hundreds of uh, distant galaxies, more distant galaxies in the background. And you can actually see a lot of detail about them. So that's the Hubble Space Telescope. And the background there is predominantly dominated by foreground stars, whereas in the case of the James Webb Space Telescope, you're seeing all these background galaxies. And this is actually providing us with more evidence for the biblically predicted Big Bang creation model. If you go on uh, uh, reasons.org, and to look up some of my articles titled Today's New Reason to Believe, you'll find two that uh, document how the Bible predicted at least three 
and possibly four of the fundamental features of what we call the Big Bang uh, creation model. And one of the predictions of the Big Bang creation model is that in the early universe, many galaxies will be spiral galaxies. But as the universe expands and these galaxies get older and older, uh, these spiral galaxies will either merge together to become spheroidal galaxies where the spiral arm structure collapses or the spiral galaxies will stop consuming small dwarf galaxies as the universe spreads apart. Uh, the supply of small dwarf galaxies uh, for the spiral galaxies goes down and so one of the predictions is we should see a decline in the density of spiral galaxies as we move forward in the universe. And what you notice uh, with the James Webb Space Telescope of both Stephens Quintet and also uh, with this cluster of galaxies is that we see these very distant galaxies and you notice how many of them are spiral in their uh, structure. And so this is verifying that indeed uh, there is a greater uh, proportion of galaxies that were spirals in the early universe uh, compared to the present universe. And uh, one of the big debates that takes place between young Earth creationists and old Earth creationists is that young Earth creationists insist that star formation stopped uh, at the end of creation day uh, four, uh, whereas astronomers are convinced that star formation is an ongoing process. And uh, this next set of images, this is a portion of the Carina Nebula, and uh, that's with the Hubble Space Telescope, and that's the best image that Hubble was able to pull off. And uh, this is a preliminary image from the James Webb Space Telescope. And again, the big difference is that these best images from the Hubble Space Telescope, we're talking multiple hours of observing time in order to get uh, the image that they got uh, whereas these images that have just been released uh, were taken in much less time. So it's basically demonstrating the power of this telescope. And what you're seeing as you compare this portion of the Carina Nebula, uh, Hubble Space Telescope, James Webb Space Telescope. In fact, astronomers have commented, this is where we see the most spectacular difference between what you get with the Hubble Telescope uh, compared to the James Webb Space Telescope. As you look at this image, you can see it's just covered with regions of star formation in the sense that you get these uh, columns of cold gas uh, where you've got hot gas squeezing them in and it basically causes that gas cloud, uh, a cloud of gas and dust to collapse and then gravity takes over and it forms a new star. And there's literally dozens of stars that are forming in this region. And notice you can see all the details of the gas clouds. And astronomers are going to be able to measure the velocities of these clouds and determine which parts of the clouds are expanding, which parts are collapsing, and where we can expect to see new stars at different stages of star formation. This kind of image has never been taken before. Uh, with a Hubble Space Telescope, they were able to look at other gas clouds where they could see some of these collapsing elephant trunks, uh, but this is just the first image taken by the James Webb Space Telescope of a quite a distant uh, molecular gas cloud, and you can just see an incredible amount of detail that previously was not possible at all. So yes, in the 21st century, uh, typically we look at the night sky and we don't see much at all with our naked eye, but God has compensated for that by allowing us to develop this amazing technology where we can see uh, the heavens declaring the glory of God uh, like never before. And what I appreciate about this Catholic bishop is he talked about star formation and galaxy formation and how the James Webb Space Telescope is going to reveal details of design and how stars form, how galaxies form in such a manner that we get the right kind of gas cloud that collapses into a planetary system in which advanced life can exist, which can look at the universe and see the glory of God manifested. So that's why I posted it this morning because I said, you know, he's right on target. Just like the Hubble Space Telescope, 
uh, gave us insights into the way the universe has been designed to reflect the glory of God in his creation. We're going to see that to a far greater degree with the James Webb Space Telescope. And what he did not comment on, there are several other telescope building projects underway uh, that are going to add uh, to the evidence for design. So what I've done in uh, this book, uh, Design to the Core, is basically give you an update on the very latest evidences for the fine-tuned designs of the universe, basically revealing chapter by chapter. No matter what size scale we look at, from the very largest size scales uh, down to the smallest cosmic size scales, we see overwhelming evidence for design. What I'm sharing with you is that thanks to the James Webb Space Telescope and another telescope nobody's paying attention to, which is called the Square Kilometer Array. It's a radio telescope that's actually operating right now, but when it's completely finished, it's going to have a collecting area of one square kilometer. It's a radio telescope, and I'm convinced that that telescope is going to reveal designs that are not going to be, uh, that are going to be new design that no other telescope uh, can see. So James Webb is getting all the publicity, and yeah, the photographs, the images are amazing, but there's other telescopes going on. Uh, one called the Extremely Large Telescope, which is actually an optical telescope with a mirror that measures 100 feet across. Uh, and there's even one that's going to be larger than that. So uh, a lot to look forward to as we continue on into the 21st century. But what I want to talk about, uh, last time I was here two weeks ago, I talked about the attempts that atheists have made to discount the fine-tuning argument and why the, their attempts uh, fail. Uh, but I want to take a more positive approach in uh, today's talk. And, uh, you know, I mentioned this last time I was with you, is uh, how as time goes by, we see more and more evidence for the design of the universe to make possible the existence of uh, microbes, not even advanced life, just microbes. And uh, you can see the documentation, uh, the citations to the uh, peer-reviewed literature at reasons.org slash fine-tuning. But it basically documents the principle we see in Job and Psalms, that the more we study, the more we learn about nature, the more evidence we'll discover, the more evidence we'll uncover for the supernatural handiwork of God, and the more it's going to reveal to us the attributes of uh, God. And we see this in the universe as a whole, what I'm trying to demonstrate and design to the core. We see this at all cosmic size levels. So last time I was with you, I went through these four uh, predominant critiques of the fine-tuning argument that atheists have marshaled. Uh, that uh, message is recorded, and uh, there's part of a chapter in Design to the Core uh, where I talk about uh, these uh, four attempts uh, to dismiss the fine-tuning argument for God as we observe uh, the universe. So uh, that's you can download that at paradoxes.org. And uh, yes, uh, this is well acknowledged in the astronomical community that we need a just right universe for life to exist. And as I mentioned previously, I've got 50 books in my office upstairs in this building written predominantly by people who are not believers uh, acknowledging that we look at the universe as a whole, we see overwhelming evidence. It's been designed to make humans exist, uh, but also for any kind of life uh, to exist. But typically, they do not dig down any deeper than that. They just simply look at the universe as a whole. And I think for people who are not followers of Jesus Christ, that's a comfortable position because now they can just keep God at an arm's length. The problem with acknowledging the design of our galaxy or our star or our planetary system or of our moon or our planet Earth, now we have this God involved uh, much closer to us. But I want to spend the uh, remaining time of my talk uh, today looking at the design of what astronomers call the large-scale structure of uh, the universe. 
And this is a recently uh, published map. And it's a map of the large scale structure, literally of the entire observable universe. And that little red dot you see in the image, uh, that dot overlaps the Lanakaya supercluster, which contains the Virgo cluster of galaxies, uh, which contains a local group of galaxies, which contains our Milky Way galaxy. To give you an idea of the size scale here, that little red dot is a whole lot bigger than the Lanakaya supercluster. In fact, it actually uh, covers what are called the local superclusters of galaxies. Say, what's a supercluster of galaxies? It's a cluster of clusters of galaxies. And actually, most of the little white dots you see here are what astronomers call super, super clusters of galaxies. In other words, a single dot there uh, would represent not just a supercluster of galaxies, but a cluster of superclusters of galaxies. Uh, so, and, but what you notice in this image, and what's interesting about this image, is that the sensitivity drops off as you go from that red dot, uh, which overlaps the Lanakaya supercluster and local superclusters, as you go out, the sensitivity drops, uh, just because we don't have uh, very powerful telescopes. But even with that, you notice we live in what's called a void. This is a region where we don't see. In fact, we don't see any nearby super, super clusters of galaxies. We do see super clusters of galaxies, uh, but none of them are very close to us. And because we're in this void within the observable universe, where we don't have any super, super clusters of galaxies, and where the super clusters of galaxies are relatively far apart from one another, it means that we're in a region of the observable universe where we're not going to have some really big, uh, supermassive black holes. And actually, there we got another language problem, too. Astronomers define a supermassive black hole as a black hole that comes in at more than uh, a million times the mass of our star of the sun. Every large galaxy has got a supermassive black hole. But a term I use in design to the core are super, super massive uh, black holes. And these are black holes that come in at greater than one billion times uh, the mass of our star of the sun. The biggest one that astronomers have seen is 17 billion times the mass of our star of the sun. The biggest one that's close enough to be of concern to us is a supermassive black hole in the center of M87, which is near the uh, core of the Virgo cluster of galaxies. It comes in at six and a half billion times the mass of our star, the sun. And fortunately, uh, its jet of deadly radiation is pointed away from us. And hey, it's 53 million light years away. So it's far away, and its deadly jet is pointed away from us. But that's not what you'd expect as you move uh, beyond uh, this local region. As you get out into this part here, we see it's filled with these super, super uh, galaxies, clusters of galaxies. And notice how close they are to one another, how bright some of them are. And that's a region uh, where you're going to be exposed uh, to these deadly, super, super massive uh, black holes. So we are in an under-dense region of the universe. And this actually explains why you have what's called uh, the expansion rate tension, uh, where our measurements of the expansion of the universe are a little faster uh, than the measurements we get in the distant universe. Because we live in an under-dense region, that actually is going to add a little factor uh, to the measured cosmic expansion rate, uh, because you're actually going to have uh, peculiar velocities uh, that are going to add to the cosmic expansion rate. Now, that is looking at what's called the largest scale structure of the universe. As we look at uh, the next layer of structure, this is where we begin to look at structures in the universe that are less than 840 million light years across. 
And when you do that, uh, you actually see uh, what's called the cosmic web. And so this is a map of uh, a region of the universe a little closer to home to kind of compare that uh, with this one. You're basically uh, looking at uh, about this much of the universe. And uh, this is what you see. Uh, you see this uh, cosmic web-like uh, structure. Now, um, I was going to show you a video clip, but it would take me too much time to set it up. So, uh, but uh, you can go on YouTube and you'll see about four really good uh, video where they actually take you through a fly through through the cosmic web where you get to go through this cosmic web and you look along uh, these little structures and you get to see the galaxies and the galaxy clusters that are there. What I'll show you instead since I don't have time, but again, go to YouTube and enjoy a tour uh, through these uh, cosmic web uh, computer simulations that you'll see there. Uh, but this kind of gives you uh, a look at what's going on with the cosmic web. And what's happening is that the anisotropies in the uh, quantum space-time fluctuations of the early universe. And we're basically talking about the universe before it's a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second old. Uh, when it's that young, uh, the quantum space-time fluctuations play a significant role in the dynamics of the universe, and those anisotropies uh, will grow as the universe expands. And you basically get the production of these bubbles. And what's generating these bubbles is that you've got a combination of dark matter and ordinary matter. Dark matter is matter that does not interact well with light. It either interacts not at all or very weakly with light compared with matter uh, that we're all familiar with, ordinary matter, matter that's made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. That has the property of strongly interacting uh, with uh, light. And uh, what happens is that you've got the, uh, these quantum space-time fluctuations expanding and creating these, uh, you know, they, these little anisotropies. But what makes it bubble-like is the fact that you get the ordinary matter and the dark matter collapsing down uh, to a little core. Uh, but because the ordinary matter strongly interacts with light, uh, you get radiation that kind of goes out. If you want an analogy, think of our star, the sun. And in the case of the sun, uh, made up of all this uh, ordinary matter, uh, that matter under gravity causes the sun to collapse. But counteracting the collapse of our star, the sun, is the radiation uh, from the nuclear fusion. Uh, so the radiation from the nuclear furnace in the core of the star is forcing the sun to get bigger and bigger. Now the reason why we don't see any change in the size of the sun is that the radiation pressure that's forcing the sun to expand is counterbalanced by the gravity, which is forcing it to contract. And the two forces are equal. And so the sun is basically stable in its uh, diameter. A similar phenomenon is happening here with these bubbles. You've got the collapse of ordinary and dark matter uh, towards these uh, cores. Uh, but the ordinary matter, uh, because it strongly interacts uh, with radiation, you get this expansion. And so what happens is the ordinary matter gets distributed in a bubble around this core. But dark matter stays here. Now the reason why you see something here, because there's about five to six times more dark matter than there is ordinary matter in the universe, the or dark matter, its gravity is strong enough that it's going to actually retain a small amount of ordinary matter with it. So in these uh, cosmic bubbles, you see uh, some ordinary matter in the core, and that's because of the very powerful gravity of the uh, 
uh, dark matter that uh, so you do get some ordinary matter here, but most of the ordinary matter gets blown out by the radiation. And so it's distributed along this bubble. And so on the surface of the bubble is where you find the ordinary matter of the universe. So on the surface of these bubbles, and again I can go back to this image here, on the surface of the bubbles is where you're gonna have the super galaxy clusters, the clusters of galaxies, uh, the local groupings, as you can see here, the bubbles are complex. On the surface of the bubbles, you have all these filaments. And along these filaments, uh, you'll have clusters of galaxies and superclusters of galaxies and groupings of galaxies. And also, you're going to have galaxies and clusters of galaxies in the centers of each of the bubbles uh, because of the fact that that's where the dark matter exists. So the dark matter uh, dominates that. But here's the bottom line, and this was pointed out, uh, oh, more than a decade ago uh, by an old-time friend of mine, Robert Kirshner. Uh, he was at Caltech the same time I was. I was a couple of years ahead of him. Uh, but he's recognized today as the world's foremost expert on supernova. And he was the one uh, that was actually for the first time able to explain why it is that this bubble-like cosmic web structure exists in the universe. But he also pointed out that because of this bubble-like structure, he called it kind of like soap bubbles, um, uh, aggregates of soap bubbles, is because of that, we now have the ordinary matter distributed at just the right way to make life possible. In other words, if it wasn't for this ratio of five to six times more dark matter than ordinary matter, these bubbles wouldn't form. And if they didn't form, the ordinary matter uh, would be far too condensed to make life possible. He says the universe is only 13.8 billion years old. And uh, you, know, you need to uh, actually get things going faster to make life possible. And he referred to this as the end of greatness. Now, what he's referring to is if you go from Earth uh, and look farther and farther away, as you go up farther and farther, you see all this amazing cosmic design to make life possible, but you reach a point uh, where you no longer see this amazing level of design. He called it the end of greatness. I prefer to call it the beginning of greatness. You begin with the moment of the universe. The universe has the just right mass, uh, the just right dark energy, uh, the just right dark matter, uh, so that as the universe expands, you actually get stars and galaxies. As I mentioned in Design to the Core, it takes amazing design of uh, uh, the very early moments of the universe to get the elements we need for life and to get galaxies and stars. And so you would expect uh, with a cosmic creation event that's not governed by God in terms of his uh, intervention, that you wind up with the universe with no stars and no galaxies at all. But it was Robert Kirshner who pointed out, you not only need a universe with stars and galaxies for light to be possible, it's essential that those stars and galaxies be distributed in a highly fine-tuned way. And he says the amazing thing about this cosmic web it ensures that the ordinary matter is distributed on the surface of these bubbles along these filaments in such a way that you can get structures uh, like our Virgo cluster of galaxies, like our local group of galaxies. If it wasn't for these bubbles, there'd be no possibility uh, for local galaxy groupings uh, with the features that would make life uh, possible. And so, what I want to talk about the next time I'm here, I'm going to be speaking at the American Scientific Affiliation meeting uh, next Sunday, actually giving my talk on Sunday. Uh, but I'll be back here in two weeks to speak about the uh, next level of design, how we go from a just right universe to a just right cosmic web to a just right super galaxy uh, cluster. And actually look at our super galaxy cluster compared with all the other known uh, superclusters of galaxies. And what's unique about our supercluster of galaxies, 
that makes life possible, uh, not just human life, but even any kind of life to be possible. And as vast as the universe as it is, with tens of thousands of super, super clusters of galaxies and super galaxy clusters, we live in the one super galaxy cluster that has the characteristics to make life possible, and in particular, advanced life possible. But life is not going to be possible in a super, super cluster of galaxies. It is possible in a super cluster of galaxies, uh, but it needs to be highly fine-tuned. But the web itself needs to be fine-tuned. And you'll see a whole chapter on that in the design of the core. Well, I'm past my 30 minutes, so I'm going to stop here. I'll take questions. And as usual, we'll take questions from the live audience, in-person audience. And we'll also take questions from the live virtual audience. So we'll alternate back and forth. And uh, Mark, I'll have you moderate. All right. Am I coming through on this? Can we all hear Mark? We got another microphone here because, yeah, we want to get this recorded. Here we go. Okay, uh, is that coming through all right? No, that's not coming through either. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, if you give me the question, I'll repeat it. Okay. Oh, now, you're, now you're on. Okay. Uh, I have one on uh, a new technology I was reading about called gravitational wave radar, or gradar. And uh, some are predicting it'll be able to detect dark matter. But do you know anything about that yet? You no, know, I probably shouldn't comment on it, because if we're talking uh, gravity wave radar, that means you're sending out gravity waves, having a bounce back, and actually getting some information. Sounds like a great idea. I think technologically, we're a long ways from being able to make that happen. As one thing to detect gravity waves from merging black holes, but to actually have something to send out a gravity wave with enough power that you can see it reflected and coming back to you. Now, maybe I'm misunderstanding the question. No, no, you're right. If I'm right on, mm -hmm. then uh, you know I wouldn't uh, be sitting on your edge of your seat waiting for that to happen. Uh, I don't know of anyone. I mean, yeah, if you could kind of marshal the power that you see in the merging of neutron stars, then that kind of technology would be possible. But for for humans to be able to manage that, I mean this. The CERN particle accelerator does not have sufficient energy to make that happen. Not by a long shot. Uh, okay, we got a question we'll go here. Ahead and do another one in house and then I'll take a couple. Okay. You think I did that? Well, I couldn't explain it until I just hear it now. And my question is, before uh, the universe, there was nothing, right? Nothing. And then God produced everything. And that, that's part of the galaxies, all of them. Is that right? That's right. And to get galaxies at all uh, takes supernatural fine-tuning. Okay. So the second question is kind of a... Uh, a question that uh, implies, implies design. What are the cockroaches good for? What are cockroaches good for? <laughs> well, as you're probably aware, cockroaches will eat anything, and so they'll take care of stuff that uh, no one else uh, takes care of. I mean, that's true of insects in general. Uh, they're ones that uh, feed on material that if that wasn't the case, uh, it could cause a problem. So they clean up after us. And so you notice that uh, you know cockroaches tend to hang around uh, messy people because they know they leave a lot of debris and a lot to feed on. So 
Uh, just like there's mites on your body that feed on all your dead skin. They process that dead skin. Somebody's got to take care of it. Uh, and just like mosquitoes, people say, well, why are there mosquitoes? Well, mosquitoes, at least where I was raised in Canada, uh, they're the one species of life uh, that feed on lemming poop. And so they process the lemming poop. So, and I'm not a cockroach expert, uh, but you can actually go online and you'll see quite a bit on cockroaches. I've been there. And, uh, you know, cockroaches have different sizes in different places. I've been to the tropics where the cockroaches are, you know, can, like two inches long. They're much bigger than the ones we have here. So, so, so I was telling my boss, even the cockroach has uh, uh, programs that are designed to, to run away from you to survive. Well, one of the amazing features of cockroaches, you're probably aware that they seem to be able to get in almost anywhere. Well, their bodies are designed uh, so that their skeletal structure can collapse down to a thin wafer and they can get under your door or get under a little sliver of your window. So yeah, the cockroach might be a quarter of an inch high, uh, but because it can collapse its body down to a fraction of a millimeter, it can get into places that uh, you know, larger insects are not able to get into. So they're hard to get rid of. And also, they're able to survive under very harsh environments. I mean, if there's an all-out nuclear war, uh, every human being on planet Earth will be wiped out, but the cockroaches will survive. So I always tell my boss, that's design. That is design. Yes. And uh, the, address, in the next question is, what's that light, uh, that uh, line be from the circumference? Oh, oh to no. no. Th this is taken from a... a uh, a peer-reviewed scientific paper where they're basically trying to describe uh, what's going on in these uh, cosmic bubbles. And so a little line you see there is talking about the average diameter of the bubble. Okay. So it's giving you an idea. And that, that line encompasses several hundred million light years. And again, uh, the extent of the Lanakaya supercluster is only a few hundred uh, million light years. So it gives you an idea of the size of the bubbles. Oh, well, we got a question from Doug uh, McComb. And uh, he asked, how long will the James Webb telescope last? And could it have been designed to be more protected from meteorites? Well, <laughs> the James Webb Space Telescope <coughs> uh, will continue operating until it runs out of fuel. And astronomers think, it depends on the research programs that they do, but they anticipate that the fuel lasts about 30 years. And when it runs out of fuel, and why it needs fuel, it needs a fuel supply in order to point the telescope in the various directions it wants. So when it runs out of fuel, it'll no longer, be, it'll just be looking at one spot in the sky. And so it, that's one reason why they made the telescope as light as it is. It only weighs half as much as the Hubble Space Telescope, in spite of the fact that the mirror is almost six times uh, greater in diameter, has about 25 times a more collecting area. But on purpose, they made it really light so that the fuel supply uh, would be sufficient to keep it operating for 30 years. But one concern is they've already discovered a micrometeorite puncture in the James Webb uh, Space Telescope. And they were anticipating this would happen, but the fact that it's happened this soon uh, is some concern. And so astronomers are worried that uh, micrometeorites or even bigger meteorites uh, could make the telescope non-functional in less than 30 years. And uh, you know, if you look at that sun shield, you'll see that they got five different layers. And the reason why they designed it with five layers of sun shielding is that they recognize, okay, if we get a micrometeorite uh, puncturing one, maybe the one underneath, uh, well, you can get one that goes through all five, but it'll go through all five at an angle that means that the sun shield will still function appropriately. But yeah, if they only had one layer, uh, then uh, a puncture uh, would now mean that that sun shield wouldn't be as effective. You say, what happens if the sun shield gets significantly degraded? 
That means the temperature of the infrared detectors at the focal point of the James Webb telescope will not be as sensitive as it otherwise would be. I mean, because of those sun shields, that detector is only a few degrees above absolute zero, which explains why you're getting these amazingly sensitive images in just a short period of time. It's because of that very cold temperature of the infrared detector. But if the sun shield gets damaged significantly, the temperature will go up and make the telescope less sensitive. So those are the dangers. But the thinking is, uh, the hope is that it'll be uh, giving us these high quality images uh, for the next 30 years. Yeah, there was a comment back from SLAM at RN. I think that Susan? That's Susan Lambo, yeah. yes. Yeah, she said uh, they're looking at least 10 years, but it may last 20. They spent le less fuel than expected getting it settled into place in the Lagrange point. Well, that's one reason why they said we, they think they can make it last 30 years, yeah. because they were much more efficient on getting the telescope to the Lagrange point. Okay. But that's a guess. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of it depends on uh, what the astronomers want to look at and how they do their observing. Uh, so the guess is uh, 30 years. Mm -hmm. But there's reason for some optimism because the Hubble Space Telescope has lasted a whole lot longer than the, what they anticipated uh, when they put it up there. So, uh, but, you know, as I've read the literature on this, 30 years is maximum. Uh, beyond that, uh, there's not much. Okay. And so we're going to need another, it's going to need to be replaced. Are, are they already designing an, another? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, I think one thing is they're realizing the taxpayer is up for it because they're seeing these amazing images and realizing, wow, we're discovering more. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, one person has made this comment on uh, my Facebook page saying, you know, what's going to happen with the James Webb Telescope? It's going to make the argument for the God of the Bible uh, far more persuasive than it's been in the past. And maybe the non-theists won't be excited about putting up another telescope. <laughs> it's going to reveal even more design. But astronomers are really interested in getting more instruments up. However, there is some pushback from some astronomers saying, if we had spent that $10 billion uh, building uh, better ground-based telescopes, we may have been able to discover more. And that's all because the original price was a little more than a billion dollars. Uh, but just like it is when you try to remodel your home, uh, the estimate you get tends to be uh, a little on the low side. Uh, you got a comment from Sentinel Apologetics. Uh, he says, uh, my health is back 100% and I'm looking forward to interviewing you, I guess, on the 28th on the topic. Well, that's so, good news because yeah. we actually prayed for Robert. We that's did. Robert Rowe in uh, Perth, Australia. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had some mm -hmm. health issues. I'm glad to hear that he's 100% uh, back again. And yeah, I am aware I'm going to be interviewed by him on his show uh, sometime in the next few days, I think. Great. So thank you, Robert. Good to hear that. Any uh, in-house questions? Yes. yes. Hi, Dr. Ross. But um, so about this cosmic bubble, I'm I'm slightly confused about uh, the the photonic interaction. Um, if I understand you correctly, you're saying that this happened very very early in the universe, like the yes. first instance. My understanding from other readings of yours is that photons, it, the universe was so hot and dense early that photons couldn't even um, freeze out. <laughs> you know, they, they weren't even, you couldn't even uh, manage, uh, the, that photons couldn't even exist because of the heat. No, they density. existed. The problem in the very early universe is that the density and the energy levels of the photons uh, were such that all the ordinary matter was completely ionized. It took the expansion, the cooling down of the universe for atoms to form and later for molecules to form. So in the early universe, the universe is too hot 
uh, for atoms to form. You have electrons, protons, uh, you've got uh, nuclei of uh, atoms, so you've got oxygen oh. nuclei, uh, but they're completely stripped of their electrons, and therefore you don't have atoms. Got it. So if we've got electrons and we have photons, the, um, the cosmic microwave background radiation didn't happen until 380,000 years after the Big Bang, is that correct? Well, the maps of the cosmic background radiation show you that moment in the early history of the universe when atoms first form. So when atoms form, uh, you actually can see the distinctions between the dense parts of the universe and the less dense. When the universe is uh, so hot uh, that all the matter is ionized, you get the same glow everywhere. So you don't see any distinction between the dense regions and the void regions of the universe. I got it. It takes Thank atoms you. to form for us to be able to see that. Um, also, uh, just a side question, is this related to the baryonic oscillation yes, measurement it is. that the Planck did so accurately? I was trying to avoid that term because I didn't want to get into technicals, uh, but yeah, what you're seeing here is what referred to as a baryon acoustic oscillations. Right. And uh, you know, I do, do my best to explain that for lay readers in the design to the core, but that's what you're seeing here, baryon acoustic oscillations. And basically what's happening is uh, that the r photons associated with the ordinary matter are generating this radiation pressure which pushes out the ordinary matter onto the surfaces of these bubbles. Now this is an idealized uh, uh, diagram you see here. What it really looks like for real is like this. They are bubbles, but they're complex. Not all the bubbles are the same size. And uh, when you see in the surfaces of the bubbles, is not an even distribution of uh, galaxies. It's a complex network of filaments. And along the filaments, you have these different uh, galaxy clusters. So this is an idealized diagram, which is basically showing you uh, these bubbles, uh, with this uh, central uh, bit of matter uh, that's there because of the gravity from the dark matter. And then along the surface you see the galaxies, uh, groupings and galaxy clusters. Uh, but it's not going to be a perfect circle. It's going to be, it's kind of, and you know, a lot of astronomers refer to it as a bunch of soap bubbles. Because if you have, you know, like a soap bubble bath, you notice that the bubbles are all touching one another but the bubbles are all different sizes, all different kinds of complexity, and therefore it looks like that. And is that why the, uh, the sine wave signature of the measurement from the Planck is this complex waveform? It's, it's not just a uniform sine wave, it's well, a that's, complex thing. That's a different matter. You're talking about the uh, monopole structure of the cosmic microwave background radiation, oh, and uh, that, that's good. another level of complexity. Okay. I deal with that in uh, the fourth edition of The Crater in the Cosmos. Your new book's awesome. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the endorsement. <laughs> uh, we have a question from Germany. Uh, Tom Boy. Mm -hmm. Good evening from Leip Leipzig, Germany. Right. Dr. Ross, I'm interested to know more about the formation of our solar system. Is our sun a third generation star? And how are the planets formed within? Well, there's two whole chapters on the planets uh, in Design to the Core and another chapter that's specific to stars. And yes, our star, the Sun, is a third generation star. The first generation stars are stars that form out of the primordial hydrogen and helium that's produced in the first few minutes after the Big Bang creation event. Uh, but those first born stars will take that uh, hydrogen and helium and fuse them into elements like carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, uh, iron, and, uh, and that will be blasted off into interstellar space. And uh, that gas mixture uh, from the exploded remains of uh, dying first generation stars now becomes the second generation of stars. And, uh, because it's got a higher mixture, not just hydrogen and helium, but it's got hydrogen and helium 
and carbon, and oxygen, and iron, and a few other elements. Its nuclear furnace is much more efficient in producing elements that are heavier than helium. And so the third generation stars uh, have a much richer mixture of elements heavier than hydrogen and helium. So for the first generation stars, elements heavier than helium measure to be 0%. Uh, the first, second generation stars, it's about 1%. The third generation stars, 2 to 3%. Our sun comes in at about 2% uh, elements uh, heavier than helium. That's heavier by mass. So, but what you're going to love about design of the core, it explains how the sun exports a certain uh, set of heavy elements uh, to its rocky planets and also exports angular momentum uh, from the sun uh, to the rocky planets and explains why the rocky planets in our solar system are unlike the rocky planets we see in any other planetary system. And so that's really a remarkable design feature, just exactly how the sun was able to export those refractory elements and angular momentum so we can have these dense, heavy metal rich, big planets orbiting distantly from the host star. And we see nothing like that anywhere else in our Milky Way galaxy. Dr. Ross, uh, would you be able to suggest uh, one or two uh, scriptures that would uh, identify with specificity uh, design elements and perhaps the earliest design elements that the scriptures could identify? And what would those design elements be? Okay, well, with respect to what we're talking about here, um, I've written an article called uh, Big Bang, the Bible Taught at First. So basically making a point that if you go through uh, the Bible, you'll see many texts speaking about the beginning of the universe, including the beginning of space and time itself, uh, where it speaks about the laws of physics being constant, where they haven't changed throughout cosmic history. And it was actually scientists at the Renaissance who looked at these biblical texts and says, and concluded, that means we can look at nature and trust what we see because there's no change in the laws of physics. And also the Bible speaks about uh, the different laws of physics, probably most extensively, the laws of thermodynamics. And uh, that's where we get the concept that given that the entire universe is subject to a pervasive law of decay that doesn't change, that's a universe that gets colder and colder as it gets older and older as it continues to expand. But in terms of specific design uh, claims uh, in the Bible, I think we're talking a little closer to home. Uh, and by the way, I complimented that article on Big Bang, the Bible taught at first uh, with another article uh, addressing a pushback I got from that article saying, well, hey, you're a 21st century astronomer. You read the Bible. You read the Bible from a Big Bang bias and therefore you're seeing in the Bible uh, things that they claim are not there, uh, which is why I complemented that with another article where I demonstrated this is not unique to 21st century astronomers. Theologians, both Christian and Jewish theologians, saw this in the Old Testament hundreds of years before astronomers uh, discovered uh, these Big Bang features of the universe. And it takes those Big Bang features to get life in the universe, to get physical life in the universe. Uh, we need a universe that's cooling down at just the right rate, expanding at just the right rate, so we get the stars and galaxies and planets and stars in which life is possible. Uh, but Steve, I think probably a more dramatic answer to your question, look at what it says in Genesis 1, Genesis 2, uh, Job 37, 38, and 39, Psalm 104 and Proverbs 8. Those are the predominant creation texts in the Bible uh, that speak about the scientific details of what God did to prepare Earth and Earth's life uh, so that the epitome of his creation, we human beings, could not only exist on planet Earth, but thrive on planet Earth. Uh, and Job in particular talks about 
why we need all these different life forms to be in place on planet Earth before we humans show up. I mean, after all, uh, if God were not to do what we see in creation day five and six, which is create uh, animals, birds and mammals, that God has designed to serve and please us and to emotionally relate to us, we would have never been able to get out of the Stone Age. And the evidence for that is people groups that lacked uh, those animals uh, remain at a low population level and remain to a Stone Age technology. It took cows, it took horses, goats, and sheep uh, to uh, enable us uh, to develop the agricultural industry uh, that catapulted us out of the Stone Age. In other words, it took those animals in order for us to develop a sufficient surplus of food uh, that we could set people free uh, to make tools uh, and to develop technology. So if you look at the history of humanity, early humans, 98% uh, of the humans uh, were employed to come up with food uh, for the community and uh, today that percentage is below 2%. Here in America it's below 1%, which means 99% of us get to write novels, uh, do art, uh, music, engineering, technology, uh, science, uh, computer advances. We're able to do all of that because we have this huge surplus of food provided by just 1% of our population. But none of that would have been possible unless we had the plants and the animals. And we were talking earlier about insects. Uh, you know, one thing I wrote in uh, design or pardon me, uh, weathering climate change. It took the ants being introduced. Ants are relatively recent. They've only been around for the past 23 million years. But ants, as well as termites, play a crucial role in ensuring that we're pulling out just the right amount of greenhouse gases to compensate for the brightening of the sun. So yeah, don't take ants for granted. Uh, God created them. Uh, so that we can live and thrive at this time. And hey, uh, I'll put a plug in, Read Improbable Planet. Uh, that's a good book to go to, to see all of the things that God did in his design to make possible human existence and human civilization. Do we have another online question? Uh, no, I don't see any. Uh, wait a minute, one second. Uh, here's one from Tim William. Tim William says the still at L paper on the Cambrian explosion causes cause notes possi possible life on Earth 4.1 billion years ago. How do you assess that early life claim? Are there implications for RTB's creation model? Yeah, good question. Tim Williams is actually on our board of directors. And a good question from Tim. Uh, there are claims that uh, people are seeing isotope signatures for life in rocks, zircons in particular, that are as old as 4.1 billion years. Probably the most credible is one from uh, rocks around Great Slave Lake in northern Canada. Uh, but none of the claims or the signatures of life of 4.1 billion years are conclusive. The evidence is strong, but not conclusive. But that's one reason why Fazal Rana and I, we came over with a book on the origin of life. We purposely titled it Origins of Life because we have undisputed evidence that microbial life goes back as far as 3.825 billion years. But there are these zircons that they discovered and even more ancient rocks that have the isotopes that appear to be uh, signatures for microbial life being earlier. And uh, <clears throat> we do know, based on those zircons, uh, that the Hadean era, uh, that's referred to as the era before the late heavy bombardment when the earth was so hellishly hot that life was impossible. Zircons now show us that there were brief episodes in specific locations on the Earth uh, where liquid water actually formed and where rocks uh, formed, where certain kinds of rocks formed. 
but these were episodes that were temporary and isolated and wasn't universal. And it explains why uh, the zircon evidence uh, for these isotope signatures of life predating 3.8 billion years uh, are rare and isolated. Uh, but uh, what it's telling us is that there are indeed uh, these rare isolated conditions on the Earth where we had not hellishly hot conditions, uh, but where we actually could have liquid water and rocks temporarily existing. So this isn't permanent liquid water. It's not permanent rocks. The earliest time we see permanent liquid water and permanent rocks is 3.825 billion years ago. Uh, but earlier than that, we do see evidence uh, for uh, rocks and uh, liquid water. But to me, if this actually stands up as compelling evidence that this isotopes really are telling us life was existing as far back as 4.8 billion, 4.1 billion years ago, episodically and temporarily, that tells me that the Creator uh, was being very aggressive in preparing the Earth as quickly as possible for more advanced life. In other words, it's a Creator that didn't wait until there were permanent uh, stable rocks and permanent uh, stable liquid water, but actually took advantage of these brief episodes of liquid water and existing rocks, certain kinds of rocks, and uh, actually created life as early as possible and as aggressively as possible. And you actually see a hint of that in Psalm 104. As you read Psalm 104, it's God packing the earth with as much life as possible and as diverse as possible. And so that interpretation of Psalm 104 would fit the model of God uh, stepping in, even where it's only episodically possible for life to exist, uh, actually stepping in and creating that life. Because that early life, the early introduction of microbes begins to chemically transform the planet uh, for advanced life. And what was an open question when we came out with the uh, book Origins of Life, how early does God need to intervene in order to get the chemistry uh, that's needed uh, for advanced life at the time that's optimal for we human beings. So, still an unanswered question, uh, but it could be answered. And yeah, uh, sometime down the road, we'll bring out a new edition of Origins of Life. Got a question from Bud here. Um, Dr. Ross, at the risk of uh, uh, speaking ahead to the next presentation, um, in the in your book, in your new book, uh, Design to the Core, um, you're talking about the Cosmic Flows 3 results. Yes. And our Lanakia, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, I hope. Yeah, Lanakia Supercluster. Supercluster. Uh, what's responsible for making our Lanakia Supercluster so, so unusual, so unique? I didn't quite grasp what was the, the sort of great attractors or whatever the dynamic mechanism. Well, that survey that? I referred to in the book is basically how they were able to define for the first time what a super galaxy cluster was. There's two surveys where they were looking at galaxy clusters and galaxies, millions of them, uh, within the local universe and very carefully measuring the velocities of the galaxies. And what they did is they subtracted out the velocity of the galaxy due to the expansion of the universe. The cosmic expansion rate has now been measured with sufficient precision that for the first time it was actually possible to do that and wind up with what they call a peculiar velocity. So when astronomers talk about a peculiar velocity of a galaxy, that's the velocity of the galaxy where they subtract out uh, the velocity due to the expansion of the universe, which gives you the velocity of the galaxy due to gravitational interactions with matter in its environment. And so what you'll see there in the book Designed to the Core is that by measuring those peculiar velocities, they were able to see super galaxy clusters for the first time. Super galaxy clusters are where the galaxies, the local groupings of galaxies, um, the clusters of galaxies, where they're all kind of 
uh, moving towards the same center. And so they define the Lanakaya supercluster of galaxies as that boundary where the galaxies are moving towards the center of the Lanakaya supercluster as opposed to moving away. And then they were able to actually do the same thing. Uh, the next one they were able to do it for was a Shapley supercluster. And noticing they could put a boundary around the galaxy clusters that make up the Shapley supercluster and actually define, hey, there again, we can look at the peculiar velocities and see that all of those galaxies and galaxy clusters are being uh, pulled uh, towards a gravitational center. Now, what was really challenging for the Lanakaya supercluster is that our supercluster of galaxies is dispersing. Because of the expansion of the universe, it's actually being dispersed. But if you take out the cosmic expansion, we can see uh, the velocities where they're heading towards a common gravitational center. Whereas with the Shapley supercluster of galaxies, it's such a dense supergalaxy cluster that it's not going to disperse any time in the near future. It's going to be stable for many billions of years. Whereas the Lanakaya supercluster is in the process of being dispersed. So hopefully that helps. But yeah, we're going to talk about superclusters of galaxies uh, next week or two weeks from now. You got a question from Mark Wilburn. What happened to the antimatter? And was that antimatter destruction event before or after the inflationary event? Okay, good question. Uh, what he's referring to is that when the universe uh, was uh, created, it had approximately equal amounts of ordinary matter and, uh, or pardon me, matter and antimatter. Uh, but as the different forces of physics separate out from one another, the universe begins with just one single force, and at 10 to the minus 43 seconds, you get uh, the gravitational force and the strong electroweak force. So now we've got two forces. And at 10 to the minus 35 seconds, the strong electroweak force separates into the strong nuclear force and the electroweak force. And I forget the exact time, it's around a trillionth of a second after the cosmic creation event. Uh, the weak uh, nuclear force separates out from the electromagnetic force. And from that point onward, the universe has four distinct forces of physics. But every time a force of physics separates out from the others, you get a symmetry breaking. And so theoretical physicists, theoretical astrophysicists believe uh, that what happened at the inflation event at 10 to the minus 35 seconds is that you have uh, the annihilation. You get a symmetry breaking where you got slightly more uh, ordinary or, uh, matter as compared to antimatter, and the difference is tiny. We're talking like 100 billion and one real particles for every 100 billion antiparticles. And you get the great annihilation event and uh, so uh, the 100 billion cancel out the other 100 billion, and what's left is the one. And so the universe has an extremely sharp uh, drop in the total mass. And if it wasn't for that annihilation event, we'd have too much matter in the universe. And so we wind up with just the right amount of matter. Now, do astronomers and physicists completely understand that symmetry breaking? They don't. But they do know if it wasn't for that symmetry breaking occurring, there'd be no life possible in the universe. And so there's something special about the four laws, uh, four forces of physics that actually enabled uh, life to exist in the universe. They have to symmetry break in just the right ways. But, uh, and there's been books written on the antimatter event, and it's still being debated. It's not fully understood at this time. Uh, but there is a consensus that there was an annihilation event where uh, the almost equal quantities of matter and antimatter annihilated one another. E equals mc squared. The matter basically got transformed into energy. 
And so that heated up the universe, uh, but it also brought down the matter of the universe to the just right level. And the energy we got up was also just right. It's getting kind of late. Uh, do you want one more question? Or no, we're at a point where we need to wrap things okay. up, so uh, we'll take questions next time. Right. And as usual, uh, people live uh, in person or live online, uh, they can raise any question they right. wish. Uh, we don't put boundaries on the kinds of questions that can be asked. And I also take questions on Facebook and Twitter. Right. So that let me close us in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of being alive in the 21st century uh, when we got this amazing technology that's revealing your glory and righteousness revealed in the heavens like never before. So yes, uh, because of human activity, uh, our huge population, our technology, uh, we have light pollution and air pollution that diminishes the glory of God revealed in the heavens, but we see it enhance thanks to the Hubble Space Telescope and now the James Webb Space Telescope, Square Kilometer Array, and many other telescopes uh, that are in operation and more to come. And Father, I pray that glory revealed in the heavens would cause us to humble ourselves before you. We pray for all the scientists uh, that are using this amazing technology that they would recognize the glory of God being revealed. And not just the glory of God, but the righteousness of God in designing everything in such a way that we can discover uh, the existence of God, his attributes, and his plan of salvation. So, Father, I pray that you would give us the humility to receive what you've revealed in the record of nature and see how it points us to what you revealed in the book of Scripture and how in those two revelations you make it so clear that you desire a relationship with us and that you're prepared to forgive us of all of our offenses against you and one another and to step-by-step step transform us uh, into the image of Christ where we can be set completely free of sin and evil. In Jesus' name, amen.